ahead and get started with our understanding homestead class today. I'm going to go ahead and introduce our sponsor for this afternoon. And as always, we want to thank our sponsors for being here. They're the ones who help keep the cost of the class low or in this case, free for you guys. As always, we appreciate that. So with that being said, I'm going to go ahead and welcome up Deanna with some close one time. Thank you. I know you guys are on Zoom, so I want to make sure everybody can see and hear. But welcome this afternoon uh, for more learning, as we're always doing. I'm Deanna Hemminger with Suncoast One Title and Closing. This is David Russell. He's our closer and uh, runs our Sarasota office, which is in downtown on Aspirin and Ringling. So we just opened our office in June in the Sarasota market. We're excited to get started and get, get some faces and names and put some, some support out there in the community. Uh, title companies, I know you guys go to the closing table to get paid. That's the best day of the of whatever day of the week you have. But just not just closings, we also are really big on supporting real estate agents. Uh, I know what it's like what, for what you guys go through. You work hard to earn your license, and now you've got to do what? Build a business. So farming your market, getting your CE credits, being able to talk to the almost, almost prospecting calls with your clients. Um, it takes practice and it's not some, you know, some of us are starting second careers, first careers. So we like to really give our time as much as we can back to the realtors, how we can make your life a little easier. We offer a lot of education, tips for different things in your business, time blocking, um, farming a market, etc. So we really want to reach out to you to be your best business partner that you can possibly have. It takes a village. I think we all know that. So not only are we excited to be here in Sarasota, but we're happy to serve your needs. And if you have questions, if you have questions on preliminary title searches, et cetera, please give us a call. David's right in the Sarasota office. He's local, homegrown from Florida. He's been in the Sarasota, Tampa area, I think most of your life, all of your life. Uh, knows a ton of history about the Sarasota buildings. We always get a history lesson when I'm up at the Sarasota office. So we really want to look to you and help you be a real resource in your uh, building your business as real estate agents. So with that, there's some goodies and snacks at the back. Enjoy your class and you guys have a wonderful day. We actually have two quick giveaways. So they could do a couple of their card in. Going once, twice. We have Karen Reyes, Paradise Realty Group. Okay, hold on a second. Okay, we'll do one more. And then we've got some two little things for you in the back. Uh, David Clapp, Remax oh, Realty. <laughs> okay, now I'm going to thank you. Yeah. All right, so thank you so much, Deanna. We appreciate you being here today. Now, with that being said, we'll go ahead and get started with our Understanding Homestead class. And I'm going to go ahead and welcome up Ms. Darla first. So good afternoon. Um, I'm here. My name is Darla First, and I'm here as chair of the Realtor Attorney Joint Committee for Raisin. And I don't know if you know much about it, but um, it's a great committee here at Raisin made up of local real estate attorneys and realtors. And what we do is we plan events like this that are particularly on the legal and, and really things that you need to know matter. Try to do one a month. Um, I understand from Cassidy and Denise that this one is uh, packed. It's a total of 190 attendees not that are virtual, including you. So we welcome you all. And so um, without further ado, the, the, as you know, as, you, as you're here for it, the topic is homestead exemption. And it is my pleasure to bring up your Sarasota County property appraiser and my husband, Bill First. <laughs> When Darla said to me she wanted me to talk strictly on Homestead, I said, I've got the perfect cast to work on Homestead. So I've got Brian Lockery here with me, who's going to talk for a very brief moment about uh, the county in general, and uh, Lynn Andrzejewski, who is going to dive into Homestead. Uh, Lynn runs the downstairs, the customer service, the Homestead. Uh, Lynn prosecutes the Homestead when we have to go after somebody. When somebody sues us for homestead, Lynn goes to court and does all the work in the court. So she really is our homestead expert. She lives it as well as every other exemption. And the exemptions she'll tell you about today, um, you know, people try and pull fast things with all of them. And she knows the statutes backwards and forwards. Brian is um, what we call the uh, deputy appraiser, uh, means he's number two in the office and he does all the work. 
So uh, he's responsible for everything that goes on there. And uh, so I think, you know, both of them are good contacts for you if you have questions and uh, hopefully they'll enlighten you on some things about Homestead. Brian? Uh, thank you for having me. Uh, first of all, those are names up there. I used to have the most confusing name in the agency until Lynn came aboard. So she now eclipses me. Brief overview of the county. I'm sure you all know the county well. It's 571 square miles. 35% of it is controlled by the government, and that does not include roads and river bottoms. Uh, it's a bigger number than I expected. We've got 290,000 parcels of real property and 26,000 tangible personal property accounts. The total value for 2021 was $96 billion. The taxable value was $70 billion. And the difference between those two is what we're here to talk to you about today, your exemptions and the caps that go along with them. Uh, people buy and sell houses, more transactions, more applicants. I don't need to tell this group that we had 8,000 more sales in 2021 than we did in 2020, transferring 9,800 more parcels. We've always been in the low 30,000 range for how many sales we have a year. It was 41,000. Uh, last year. So without further ado, I will turn you over to the subject matter expert, Lynn Andreas. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. As Brian said, I am here today to talk to all of you about exemptions. Uh, I just want to give a little brief overview that this is a disclaimer, that this is our policies in Sarasota County. They are our procedures and they are not of any other county's interpretations of the statutes. Although they might vary a little bit, we're pretty much on course. Can everyone hear me okay? All right. So property subject to taxation. So chapter 196 is where the focus will be today. And I'll try not to be so uh, into the statutes and dive deep. I'll try to keep it surface level, just like when I teach my staff. So chapter 196, Florida statutes, it's, it's clear. It's unless expressly exempted from taxation, the following property shall be subject to tax, all real and personal property in the state. Our focus is gonna be on the real side with the exemptions. And why does that matter? Look at this tax comparison. These are two homes in the same neighborhood and the home on the left has no homestead. It's at Heatherwood Lane, just and taxable and just by the way is market, you see on our website and that's how it's defined in statute is the same. Their tax bill being $2,604. Whereas the homesteaded parcel on the right, their neighbor has a very different tax base. Their just is 183.4, which is higher than the one next door. However, their taxable value after exemptions and save our homes cap is 1,411. Compare, go ahead. Before you advance, I just want to point out, if you look at the car, this is a paired villa. These are two sides of the very same building. So the tax bill on the right is 85% less than the tax bill on the left. That is a big difference. So it's important when you have buyers uh, post-closing, the best advice is to tell them to come and make an exemption application in our office. It must be an exemption. And that's why it matters. That difference between market and assessed, that save our homes cap, which we'll get into, is the very reason that is the biggest benefit beyond the homestead exemption. I will dive right into ad valorem tax exemptions. And I'll tell you that all of my staff, uh, we all love to get the new buyers in and the existing buyers who bought a new property and in Florida, we like to teach them. We wanna hear from you guys as well and teach them about what happens with their homestead. Whether they apply online or apply in-house, they're gonna get the same treatment, okay? In order to benefit though, they must make the application. Failure to make an application by statute constitutes a waiver for that tax year. And there is nothing we can do once the Department of Revenue has those finalized numbers, okay? So from the point in time to qualify, an applicant must be a Florida resident with credentials. Own, occupy the property, 
as their permanent residence as of January 1 of that tax year. Thank you. The application must be made by March 1st. And when that application is seeking an exemption, if they miss that deadline in Sarasota County, we do based upon otherwise qualified, we will farm out and look for those late applications that tip over into the next tax year. And we will try to qualify them. But the March one is the deadline by statute with an extenuating circumstances deadline of late otherwise qualified up to the 25th day after trim. Which would be the middle of September. Thank you. So for homestead exemptions, what do they need? So all of these credentials, if they gather them, it would be driver's license, voter registration at the address of record. If they have their tax bill, that gives them the parcel ID number, makes it easier for them to find their account number or for our staff to find their account number. But if they're home online, and by the way, our online system is at 70% of online filers this year. So our online has picked up steam, mostly due to the COVID and the closings, but we're very proud of the product. It's very simple and easy to use. It's convenient. Your taxpayers can do it from anywhere. And as long as they have these credentials, they can get through the application process. And we qualify based upon these credentials, including your date of birth, social security number for each applicant. In the interview process, whether it be online or in-house, we're going to clear all of these exemptions that you see in front of you. We're going to speak to the applicant or in the online process, they're going to go through a series of questions to ensure the highest and best benefit for all the qualified applicants, whether it be widowed, civilian disability, veterans disabilities, surviving spouse or first responders. And what can they expect for the exemption? So the important part is to remember, the first 25,000 in exemptions applies to all property taxes. The second 25,000 applies to the assessed value over 50,000 and only to non-school. Okay, so 75,000 in value for a home will get them a $50,000 exemption. And we all know the values in Sarasota have gone up so most properties will get the full benefit of the homestead and beyond that any other of those other exemptions will stack on beyond those exemptions once we take the application whether it be online or in-house we will review the deed we will look at that ownership and determine their entitlement based on ownership and use in qualifying so for example, a deed with an individual as an owner, we will get grant 100% entitlement to the exemption. That means that the assessed value or the percentage of assessment limitation protection under the homestead would be 100% on the property. For joint tenants with rights of survivorship or tenants by entirety, they would also get that 100% protection. Now tenants in common, it depends on how many and if there is a named percentage for those who are applying and it's on the deed. If it is not named on the deed, then it's based on the number of owners. For example, three owners would be 33, 33, 33. Uh, for four owners, 25, 25, 25, based on who is making the application, who's qualifying, will blanket that assessment limitation protection for their market share. And similar with trust, it's proportionate shares up to 100%. Trusts are the, for the trustees benefit with equitable or beneficial title. Okay, so when we review those documents, we then can apply how much they receive. Now for the good part, what happens next? So when I'm done taking an application or anybody in our office is done, mm -hmm. The answer is what's next? What is next is always the question. And the answer is always, okay. So if you're a first time home buyer for Florida, your market and assessed are equalized. And I always use my hands when I speak. Um, it's easier to show and demonstrate. 
So as a market climbs and your base in the property stays constant and only increases for assessment limitation, there's a difference now every year after you homestead. And in a climbing market, which we are in, we'll see a save our homes cap benefit. That spills over into that non-tax bucket. That non-tax bucket is the most valuable portion beyond the homestead exemption itself. Unless you have a total and permanent benefit that save our homes bucket, which we'll get into more deeper in later on in the presentation, that is the most valuable benefit. But to maintain those exemptions, we then go into, we tell the customer, the taxpayer, that the homestead is renewed annually. And that's based on a county ordinance here in Sarasota, whereas we, the property appraiser, have a renewal card, which we mail annually by February 1st. That prescribes that it's the owner's responsibility to inform the property appraiser of changes in status of the owner or use of the property. Changes in status of the owner, for example, life-changing events, marriage, death, divorce, those things may affect the property and the entitlement to the exemption. Those changes may affect it in such a way that if you don't tell the property appraiser that there is a change and you are falsely claiming, there are severe penalties. And we note that on the card. Next, this is the example of the card. This is the 2022 card. It gets mailed out. This is the side that would be returned to us. It's negative response only. So each homeowner, after the year that they qualify and have the receipt that they filed and are granted the exemption, they will get this card each February. This serves as a reminder to be sure to consider all of these items. So for example, if they no longer occupy the property, when did they move? I'm no longer a permanent resident of Florida. My new mailing address is. This property was entirely or partially rented. And what are those dates? Marital status has changed. Again, those life-changing events could alter the eligibility for the homestead. So making the notification timely to the property appraiser is the taxpayer's best defense is putting us on notice. We're putting the taxpayers on notice that we're renewing them automatically and we expect a response if there is a change. If the owner is deceased, the surviving spouse perhaps, or a family member who's getting the mail, we get a lot of those jotted in. Or the last one, I am not eligible to receive the homestead or other exemptions on this property because I or my spouse are claiming the benefit of permanent residency elsewhere. There is an entire section of the statute dedicated to just this. This point is going to be something that you're gonna hear over and over. Claiming or receiving elsewhere is negates and precludes you from receiving the benefit here in Florida. And now we're back to save our homes and my little graph with the climbing market with my hands. Uh, so in 1992, we have had the voters initiative to create the Save Our Homes cap, which is after the initial year of homestead and that base in the property that I spoke of before. So after the base year where market and assessed are equal, the Save Our Homes limits that or suppresses the assessed limitation for that home. So in this example, 2019 is the taxpayer's base year where market and assessed are the equal and the exemption is then applied. We look forward to 2020, there is a 6% increase of market and the assessed limitation or CPI consumer product index is 2.3% bringing the assessed value to 306.9. Less the exemptions brings you to taxable value 
And if you notice the difference between market and assessed is that bucket that's growing. That's the sheltered value that is limited and not taxed. That is at 3% in 2020. Look forward to 2021. It's 340,000 for market. That's a 7% increase over the prior. 1.4% was CPI for 2021. And then that sheltered value bucket grows to 28,803. That's an 8% increase. Moving forward to 2022, this is projected numbers only. <laughs> We're not done with the tax roll. As an example, we have a 10% increase in market. We have a 3% limitation on CPI. Therefore, that save our homes bucket is all the way up to 15%. That tax, non-tax sheltered value is portable from home to home. When you hear about portability, that's the save our homes cap in action. And it's portable from home to home, provided that the taxpayer establishes a new homestead within three years of the previous homestead. They can then port or take that value with them. So in this slide, and market and just are determined by the property appraiser, 500,000 is the maximum rule according to statute 193155 and the application, which is the DR501T filed along with the DR501, which our office will do, will automatically ask for the previous address, any previous homestead addresses, and we will help you to get your portability savings, even if it is from another county. So in county and out of county is all done where you make the application for homestead. So in this example, the existing homestead, 400,000 market value, the assessed was 250,000. The portability benefit that the taxpayer had was 150,000. Now, if they upsize, meaning the market determined by the property appraiser of the new property is more than the market of the existing homestead, then they get to take all that cap with them up to $500,000. In a downsize, however, it's proportionate. And what do I mean by proportionate? It means that we're gonna put you in that same position. So in this example, the market value of the new property on a downsize at 200,000 is half of the prior house, right? This existing one was 400, the new one is 200. So their portability benefit is going to be halved. Okay, so they get to take all of it with them, but it's applied at half because it's a downsize. I just want to throw in there that three years isn't really three years. Uh, as I like to say, you know, it's government, so things might not make a whole lot of sense. It's actually three January 1st. So if you close on December 6th, the first year ends less than a month later. So keep that in mind when your clients are buying and selling and, and moving. It's within three January 1st. So, um, Brian, do you want to mention to them that I think folks are going to be okay if they want to email you all that you will send them a link to this PowerPoint? Are you okay with that? Yes. Yes. At, at the end, there will be uh, contact information as well. <laughs> so you can get the PowerPoint presentation. Right. And we always encourage people, any questions, mm -hmm. just call. We'll, we'll figure it out for you. Yeah. Absolutely. So as Brian was saying, is there, there's a look back, okay? But that look back is limited. So if you're leaving your prior home and you're wanting to port to a new home for 2022, we can only look back to a maximum of three tax years. So if it's 22, you can only port from your previous homestead from 21, 20, or 19, period. It's not from the date is from the January one. So as Brian said, if you abandon your home at the end of a year, that year is gone because you in essence got that benefit in that tax year, okay? I have a question. What happens if say two siblings own a home 
and one sibling buys the other sibling out. So they stay there and then the other one buys elsewhere. How would Homestead work in that kind of a situation? <laughs> the answer. So, so, so the question is uh, for those on Zoom, <laughs> if two people are co-owners of a home and one of them moves and the other one stays in the home, how, how does the portability work then? I'll pass the answer to her. <laughs> <laughs> so the answer is it depends. You know what it depends on? The entitlement slide. So in 193.155, there are very specific rules about portability and when you can port and take your cap with you. If that home is owned 100% with survivorship rights and not everybody abandons that home, it stays. If its own tenants in common, it ports. And then the, the person who's staying abandons and reapplies, okay? Anytime there's a change in ownership, it's reset to market. Or a change in exempt to non-exempt, it's reset to market. There's always that change, which takes me right into the next slide. So 193.155 sub 3A. Uh, states that real property resets to market value on January 1 following a transfer. So your buyers out there, and I'm going to say this with caution because they might have the exemption on the property when you look, but then up until March 1, if they make a determination that they're selling, they're, they're going to remove their exemption because they already bought something else, the seller already bought something else, and they're going to apply and we take those exemptions off, your buyer is not going to have any, okay? So buyer inherits the tax status. Whatever that tax status is on January 1, they inherit. Then on January 1, following the transfer, it resets for them. And there could be a reset on the seller's part because if that seller takes away that exemption and puts it on their other property, before, or they've abandoned that property, or we find that they didn't qualify for the exemption, and we have taken action to take it off, it will not be there for a buyer in all instances. So the seller's exemptions, if any, do terminate at the year end. There is no in the middle for the exemptions. Okay. If the property is placed in the trust, there's a change of beneficiary interest. How does that matter? As long as the, uh, sorry, go ahead. We have to repeat the question. Sorry. If property is owned <laughs> by land trust and the beneficiary changes, how does that affect the exemption is what right. you're asking. That was my question. Is it typically the trust document is not recorded so you have no way of knowing. Correct. And, and uh, we will need to see the beneficiary on the trust document. But we do not keep a copy. Uh, in our records, but as, as to how it affects. Yeah. So if, if the uh, beneficial interest or if any property, for a matter of fact, let's just speak universally. If I have a property and I transfer it into my trust where I'm the trustee and I retain a grant of possession and a right to use that property, that cap savings gets exempt from that reset rule because I still have legal or benefit equitable title in that property. But in the case of a trust where we have a new applicant coming in and we go to look in public record and we see no evidence of that name listed anywhere on that deed, the last instrument in public record, we're gonna wanna see something that shows legal or equitable title to that property in order to grant that homestead. All right. So now we're gonna get into ways you can lose your homestead. And this is because of failure or something that we find within uh, our daily works, that we find something, a reason that the exempted party no longer qualifies, or the fact that we've been told by the property owner in a timely manner that they no longer qualify. Now we covered all that in the card, in the renewal card. We take information on a daily basis, such as address changes, uh, changes to deed, 
We review marriages, divorces, death records. We review all of those because we want to meet our mission to the best of our ability. We want to administer these exemptions and make sure that everyone gets the full entitlement that they, they're eligible for. And not only that, if someone is paying less unfairly, then all of us are paying more. Does that make sense? So whenever there is a violation on a homestead, we're obligated to recover that. And when we speak to recovery, it's not only the improperly exempted taxes for that 50,000, which is three to 500, 350 to 400 to $500 per homestead per year, recovering that back, but then it's also the assessment limitations. And as we've seen, they can grow very quickly in a climbing market. And if we're going to lean someone and they have a $100,000 cap, then a $200,000 cap, a $300,000 cap, that save our homes cap up to 10 years is recaptured along with the homestead exemption portions. Then it's calculated for the escape taxes at that millage rate for that year. Then there's a 50% penalty. And then there's 15% interest applied by the tax collector. That 15% interest is computed based on the November 1 due dates for each year of the tax lien. So that interest can compound rather quickly on a 10 year lien. Okay, the number one way to lose your exemption. If you notify us timely, great. We'll take it off timely. If you don't notify us, it's a violation. So 196012 sub 18 describes permanent residence, the place where a person has made their permanent, true, fixed, principal establishment of residence. Wherever absent, they have an intent to return and continually maintain their exemptions and maintain their credentials at that address. These are two DCA cases where we were affirmed by the lower court's decisions where these individuals did not maintain their property as their primary. And more importantly, only one credential got them there. Okay, not having a, a voter at the homestead address of record got uh, Ms. Grenard Gradenario there. Uh, she flew down to Florida, bought a home. Then she went back to Colorado, registered to vote and continued to vote in federal, state and local elections, thus declaring herself to be a permanent resident of the state of Colorado. And Mr. Wolpert, uh, he uh, wanted to drive the, is it a honey truck or wagon? Honey wagon. Honey wagon. Anyone know what a honey wagon is? I didn't either till I got to, to this case. Did you? Oh, it's one of those vehicles that drives around and empties the porta potties out. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> so he wanted to drive this honey wagon and get it. He got a commercial license in South Dakota. So his commercial CDL, he attested that he was a resident of South Dakota and drove this honey truck year after year and enjoyed the motorcycle rally, I think it's Sturgis, uh, that they have out there annually, but he couldn't ride, he couldn't drive the honey truck unless he was a South Dakota resident, uh, but he was claiming and receiving benefits here. So in that case, the lower courts affirmed that all other of his credentials were circumstantial because he attested in writing and got a federal ID compliant driver's license in another state. So that action in itself was another one thing that made him no longer a resident of Florida. The you know, other thing, anyone know how many days you have to live in a house to have it be your permanent residence in Florida? I guess. 
That's usually what everyone says. The actual answer is zero. You, you don't, have, there was a court case a few years ago, uh, Garcia v. Andoni, where the court ruled that you never have to actually be in the house. Uh, you have to intend to occupy the house. And like everything else in there, you can't have one anywhere else. There's only one primary residence and no other residency-based exemption anywhere else. But you actually don't have to occupy it. The classic example that uh, Bill likes to use is O.J. Simpson maintained a homestead while he was in prison. In Florida. Yeah. That's true. But he intended to live here. He did. <laughs> <laughs> he probably would have preferred that. <laughs> so when we interview a customer for the exemption, when did you declare this property to be your primary is how we phrase the question, not where were you the night of the first? Okay. <laughs> because it's their intention to make it their primary. And of course their credentials have to be there, but they don't, as long as no one else is. Okay, the next, if you choose to demolish your dwelling on the property, the homestead will be removed. Homesteads cannot be granted on vacant land and that vacant land exception would be calamity. I am not referring to a calamity where a calamity is defined as a natural event storm, floods, hurricane, uh, where something happens to the house and it has to be removed or rebuilt. This is voluntarily, I wanna take it down and I wanna rebuild a bigger one, a new one, something to that effect, where it was affirmed by the second DCA, Baldwin v. Enriquez out of Hillsborough, where the Baldwins pitched a tent on the property and thought that was enough to declare this to be their homestead. And another case locally here in Sarasota County where Mr. Avila tore down his home where he wanted to build a bigger one. And he came in uh, years later and I noticed, oh, there's no house on the roll. And up until Baldwin v. Enriquez, we used to allow three years to rebuild, but that Baldwin B. Enriquez says, there must be a dwelling to reside upon absent a calamity. So there is no calamity. There can't be a homestead on there. So if you have a client that's buying a teardown, please have them call us because the best thing to do, if there is an opportunity to homestead, because the cap will disappear when the value of that house disappears, most of the cap will disappear. If the land has a value and the home has a value, and then you take away the home, part of that assessed value or cap that they're looking to save just evaporates. It's gone the next tax year. While the land may be more valuable as empty, it doesn't qualify for the homestead. So what we would recommend is that they remove the homestead timely and then refile and port back when they build, as long as it is in with that window to port back. Uh, also, there's one day that matters when it comes to all of these things, and that day is January 1st. So if there's a house there on January 1st, you can have your homestead for the rest of the calendar year. It's the next January 1st when it's a vacant lot that you would not. Uh, unfortunately, the other product of that is if the house is there on January 1st and it burns down on January 2nd, the house is there for purposes of the tax roll for the whole year. So uh, that would be between the homeowner. I don't disagree. <laughs> yeah, that's hard. <laughs> yes, there's a legislation this year to allow this product of that condominium that collapsed on the uh, East yeah. Coast to allow that sort of circumstance to be exempted from this from this rule. Yeah. So if something so, like that happens, you don't add insult to injury. So they're working on that? Yes. Yes. Right now. Okay. I didn't know that. So number three, if you or your spouse are claiming or receiving or make application for a residency-based benefit, property tax exemption in another state. 
Now we have in here newlyweds take note because the effect of marriage, that life-changing event that we talked about earlier, could box someone out of qualifying for their exemption that they had for a long time without notification to the property appraiser and we're not aware, it's going to become very problematic. And in the case of 196031 sub five, claiming or receiving elsewhere, a tax credit, a homestead, owner occupancy as in Ohio, which is our number one state where we find multiple exemptions. Uh, other states include New Jersey, Indiana, pretty much all of them but a lot of them come from Ohio, that owner occupancy. Folks don't compute the fact that they're claiming a homestead here, but it's called something else somewhere else, okay? So we have several DCA cases that affirmed and based off of Ensley v. Broward, which overrode Wells, how, Wells Valier's decision. And then the statute was reworded and it, a new law came into effect to clarify this. So the Wells Valier decision was placed aside and Ensley v. Broward is the one that certifies the, the language is clear in the law. You cannot claim or receive elsewhere. And that's also on that renewal card that we showed earlier. Okay, the next is if you or your spouse are claiming or make an application for homestead benefits on another property in Florida. Well, it's fine if you're gonna move and notify the property appraiser timely that you're not claiming elsewhere. But if you want to be separate and apart from your family unit, as a husband and wife is one family unit. And according to the constitution, there's only one exemption allowed per individual or family unit. The statute is silent as to this. It goes right to the Constitution. And again, Ensley v. Broward affirmed that you can't claim multiple exemptions when you have an intact marriage. Intact marriage means you have a familial and financial entanglement. Okay, so filing a, a joint tax return, uh, mortgages with each other's names, insurance, bank accounts and such, disqualifies one for receiving two exemptions. Okay, this one, any attorneys take note. If you divorce, your interest in the property automatically becomes tenants in common. And that's Florida Statute 689-115. The tenants by entirety upon divorce, dissolution of marriage shall become tenants in common. The language is there and it's very, very clear. We do look up and get the dockets for every final judgment that's recorded in the county, again, to meet fair and equitable standards, to try to review these and get those taxpayers on notice. The ones that didn't tell us if you were divorced in Sarasota County, we're gonna come across it and it could be a violation by the point we come across it. So those life-changing events that we mentioned for the cards, marriage, death, divorce, here's where the divorce comes in. So when it's 50-50 and the abandonment of that marital home happens, the property in that cap, that Save Our Homes cap, by law is split 50-50 based on their shares, but According to 193155, there's a statute subsection in there that allows an allocation of those shares. So for example, if you have a divorced couple, one's buying property A, which is an upsize, the other's buying property B, which is a significant downsize. If that cap is not gonna evaporate into thin air, if it's split 50-50, that downsize effect will certainly have a negative impact on that divorcee. So there's an allocation that can be made. Uh, divorce attorneys can help to make those calculations. I have helped to make some of those allocations. I've seen 80-20 splits happen because that cap will disappear on a downsize and you wanna be able to get them the maximum. Now the maximum, because they're splitting, would be 250,000 
each because it's the 500,000 was that max cap that we talked about earlier. And that cap, more often than not, when we take an application from a divorced party, they had no idea what was going to happen with the cap. They had no idea that it's even considered an asset. It's a contingent asset, which attorneys should all take note that that might be the bargaining chip that closes the deal for a, a marriage when it's in dispute. Um, and the filing deadline for the form? The filing deadline for the form is it must be in the hands of the property appraiser when you make your application. It's when that home is abandoned. So on that DR 501 TS is all the explanations as far as the timelines, everything in statute as far as forms is March 1. But to get it to us, and then if they move out of county, we would provide their proportionate cap based on that allocation. All right, here's the, here's the one that we get all kinds of questions and requests about information. Uh, we get a ton of anonymous tips for renting property on January 1. Two sections of the statute cover this. The rental of all or substantially all on January 1 constitutes abandonment. And 196031 states that the exemption applies only to those parcels classified and assessed as owner occupied residential property or only the portion of property so classified and assessed. What does that mean? It means that if you have a duplex and homeowner is living in side A, renting side B, the entitlement to the homestead was only on the portion that they were residing in. They decide to rent that on January 1, it's fully abandoned. We don't get notification, that's a violation. If it's a timely notification, we can take it off. But if we don't get timely notified, then it becomes one of those clawback situations. And believe me, I have sat with tenants who said, I fell off the balcony. I'm suing my landlord. And I looked and there's a homestead over and over again, or a crazy, crazy one was, and I could tell you many crazy ones. Um, <laughs> there's one where the tenant calls and says, I just heard my landlord's voice coming through a hidden camera in the ceiling. And I'm in my laundry room in my underwear. And I said, well, okay, how can I help you? <laughs> you know, we're not 911. <laughs> so how can I help you? I'm supposed to be buying this property. And I think I just blew the deal. Okay, what's the address? Is, you know, is it in Sarasota County? Look up the address, it's homesteaded. How long have you lived there? Eight years. So there's a lot of times where the tenants turn in, a lot of times where the neighbors turn in, a lot of times where eviction papers are filed in the public record. There's a lot of times where just things go wrong between owners. There's a lot of times where they'll walk into our office, file for the exemption, walk right next door, go back to voter, rescind their registration, go down to West Palm Beach, and homestead there. We don't know until something comes up and triggers us to know. So if there's a rental on the first, it is a violation. If it's timely notification, it's not a violation. This is a good one. This is one of those rules where uh, we always, always get questions about this. Now it's not January 1st, it's January 2nd and I wanna rent can I rent? Sure, we're not gonna tell you that you can or can't do anything. Do you qualify and will you continue to qualify for the exemptions is where our concern lies. What's the property use? Are you transferring it to commercial use? Six months or more makes a property commercial use, but this is the abandonment rule which allows one to homestead, homestead and then rent 30 days 
per calendar year for two consecutive years. If they rent more than 30 days per calendar year for two consecutive years, it's a violation. So we have all these short term little rentals that if you tell us, we can track it and help you. If you call us, we can help you and work with you and explain. If you violate it and we catch you, it's going to cost in taxes. And there's a lot of times where we would see that huge cap disappear because they wanted to rent for six weeks. Or my property manager convinced me to do it. I was gonna be away, I'm a snowbird. And it happened and it happened again. And oh, the money was great, so it happened again. So that's a violation. Yes. Yes. So that's two consecutive years. What if you rent it for 45 days one year, skip a year, rent for 45 days the next year? Would that not apply? So the question was if you alternate years, rent it for 45 days, then no days, then 45 days, and, and alternating years. Right. So technically, you can go ahead and do that. Uh, keep track because when that money comes in and it looks good, they're apt to do it again and they're apt to do it again. And they think I won't get caught until we start looking at tourist tax. We look at tourist tax lists for short term rentals. Uh, we have a partnership with the tax collector to do so and they inform us of those new accounts. So it takes work and it takes time, but we'll find you. <laughs> Interesting fact about the 30 days, that law is not that old. It used to be you, you couldn't at all, but it was put into play for the Players' Championship Golf Tournament at TPC Sawgrass. Apparently, <laughs> Tom, apparently there, was, there was a lot of people who would rent out their substantial homes for the month and make a killing on it. They would move out of their own house to do it. So yeah. this, this is how this got here. All right. Sorry. You're fine. <laughs> You're absolutely fine. All right, so again, Mr. Wolpert, if you maintain or obtain a driver's license or state issued ID card in another state, federal law requires licenses or IDs to be registered to the person's permanent residence. So that federal real ID compliance, that painful thing that we all went to, through to get the gold star and the driver's licenses, every state went through that. The TSA requires that to get on a plane. So that federal law, um, put some teeth into our local law and gave us the Wolpert, uh, the first win, which is at the DCA affirmed. Um, and that's all it said. It was affirmed. So it agreed completely with the lower court's decision in our favor that his driver's license claiming elsewhere that one thing um, took away his homestead and everything else was circumstantial. His bills, his Here's proof that I live there. Here's my mail. All that other stuff was circumstantial. If you are registered to vote in another Florida county or state, again, this one thing, which section 196015 is all of the items to which the property appraiser uh, looks at for a homestead, which are in the application, proof of voter registration at this address. I don't know how that's ringing. I shut it off. <laughs> okay, so Miss Gradinario, as I mentioned earlier, her voter did not match the address because she flew down from Colorado, bought her condo, got a driver's license, got her voter card, homesteaded, flew back to Colorado, and continued to vote in those local elections in her home state of Colorado. Uh, so she uh, went to the DCA and she was also affirmed per curium. And that was the one she represented herself. Yes. Yeah. I want to read some interesting briefs. <laughs> That's the one. Oh, that is the one. Okay. So here's where the benefits are, are big, but the cost is a lot. So for example, any surviving spouse type benefits that are granted by our offices and there's a new marriage. So we ask that life-changing question. 
Is there a marriage? Is there a divorce? Did someone die? All those questions are on there. So if they remarry, those, those surviving spouses remarry. If they're, they have the widow's exemption, that's removed. First responder surviving spouse is removed or the veterans disabilities, whether it's the 65 and older, which is a direct tax discount uh, up to the amount of 100% for any combat surviving spouse. Uh, the total and permanent veteran, uh, the disabled veteran up to 5,000 on that parcel or the fallers, fallen heroes line of duty exemption. The fallen heroes line of duty exemption is for any military service member who's killed in the line of duty, that surviving spouse receives 100% exemption. And it doesn't matter what state, according to the Supreme Court's recent decision, that doesn't have to be a Florida veteran. They're a veteran, they fought for the United States and the Supreme Court agreed. So that exemption would be granted on any fallen service member's spouse. But if they remarry, they cannot claim the exemption here any longer. If they claim residency in another state while continuing to benefit from those surviving spouse benefits, that's also a way to lose that exemption. And these, as you can imagine, because most of them are 100% exemption when it comes to the total and permanent and the fallen heroes, that's 100% tax savings on all the non ad valorem, all the top of the tax bill. So then that comes back as a recapture. That's pretty hefty when you add in penalties and fines. Happy Valentine's Day, don't get married. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry, Dave. Do you agree? Um, so you see this on that last um, lecture, the first responders. Uh, is it a bigger tax break then in the general public? Or is this just they do? Nope. Oh, okay. you shake your head. Oh, shake my head to Bill. Uh, mm -hmm. The question is Does the first responder get a larger tax break than? Or anyone on that list. Or, or does anyone on this list get a larger tax break than a uh, standard homestead exemption? And the answer is no. The answer is yes. Oh, okay. So, do you remember in the slide in the beginning where we were going through the application mm -hmm. and all those additional benefits? Mm -hmm. This is part of those additional benefits. So the first responder, um, I'll point out, is Florida first responders only. So if we have a police officer, an emergency medical technician, a fireman, or a correction officer who's injured in the line of duty for a duty-related or cardiac event in conjunction with their employment, and they become disabled, uh, no longer able to work in that field, and can't seek gain gainful employment otherwise, then they're entitled to a 100% exemption on their ownership share. And if they're married, their spouse can get a surviving spouse benefit. Do those benefits apply if they were a first responder in a different state and are no longer able to work, but then they move to Florida and still cannot work? Do the benefits apply if they were a first responder out of Florida when the incident happened and then they moved to Florida? That's a good one. Great question. The answer is no. <laughs> Only because it's Florida first responder. So they must meet the statutory requirements for being certified as such. But in the opposite way, if you are a Florida first responder and you're sent to Texas to help fight a fire and you're injured there and come back, you're still covered by that. Thank you. Okay, the next one. If you are an unqualified surviving spouse of a deceased homesteaded property owner, let's say there's a couple who is estranged and we granted the exemption to Mr. He's resided here all of these years while his spouse resided separate family unit in another state. And that benefit stays on there because we didn't know Mr. Past. Unless that spouse comes in to qualify and proves that they did not receive an exemption elsewhere, we cannot carry that exemption forward for that unqualified spouse.
and the last one of the 12 ways. If you are claiming an exemption for which there is an income qualification and you add members to your household. So when you think of household, you have to remember it's the occupants in the house, not necessarily the owners of the house. Typically, this would happen in the case where a we have a senior limited income and they get married or take in a companion, their significant other, and the income of the household expands or doubles. That could box them out from qualifying from the household income limitations of the senior exemption. In the same way, if there's a gross income test for total and permanently disabled persons meeting the income limitations, blind or in a wheelchair, and they take in a companion or get married and their income doubles. That is also another example of getting boxed out of that exemption. So if they had 100% exempt and each year they have to pro provide information to the property appraiser for the disability and meeting the income limitations and they go over that amount, they could be in a very different tax situation in the following year. And we've seen that happen. Another thing to think about when you have seniors required minimum distributions from IRAs that are not Roths are taxable. So that bump up at 72, when they start having to draw down, might change their tax status. So in those cases, we send a new card or the annual senior qualification, notifying the senior of the amounts and the limitations. And again, that is a negative response only where they would have to tell us that they no longer qualify. In the same way, for the total and permanently disabled, that gross income notification is sent annually once the Department of Revenue gives us the amounts and the limitations for those incomes for disabled persons. We notify the taxpayer and they have to send us back their income in a supplemental form on an annual basis. Those amounts are published on our website as well as soon as we're informed by the Department of Revenue. What are they now? Yeah, good question. It's 36, <laughs> I want to say. It, it's yeah. never just a nice even number. So. Right. I know the senior one because I've been repeating it over and over again on the phones and in person, 32,561. That's adjusted gross income. And by the way, the disabled person's gross income includes those things that's not included in adjusted gross income. So all of the veterans uh, disability benefits, if they're a recipient of those, or all of the social security is considered in their gross income, along with uh, any interest, any retirement accounts, any rentals, sale of stock. There's an entire schedule where they're required to report those. Okay. Can I go back to 11 where the unqualified spouse, an individual passes, mm -hmm. their spouse is in another state, the spouse decides to come and live in that house of the deceased individual and make it their homestead, selling their property in another state. Does it have to go back to base? or can they just take over the homestead of the uh, deceased individual? They're, they're still married. Mm -hmm. They're just living separately. One spouse from another state comes back to live in the house of the deceased individual within the calendar year. Can that homestead continue? So the question for those on Zoom was, uh, Husband lives in a home in Florida, has a cap and a homestead. Spouse lives outside of Florida. Husband dies. Spouse comes and moves into this house, makes continues to live there, makes it their homestead. Do they, does the cap survive? Does the homestead cap, in, as it existed for the husband, continue for the wife? The answer is, it depends. For the most part, no. So if there are no dependent minor children, residing in the property where the deceased 
was exempted in that home, then there is no survival of the cap because they were separate family units and the estranged spouse who was living in another state is claiming a benefit elsewhere and therefore never qualified here for the entitlement of that husband's cap. Now that can be debated in court sometimes, but um, if there is a minor child involved and that benefit can continue because that minor child is a legal and natural dependent of the deceased and now the surviving spouse, the estranged spouse is here moving into the home and caring for that child, uh, Sarasota County would keep the cap for that property. Because the scenario is for an unqualified. Correct. Surviving spouse. Okay, ways to reach us. Online is the best. We have the most information there. We're all very proud of our website. You can file for an exemption probably all very familiar with searching for properties, looking up maps, seeking information. We have nice quick links to deeds. Uh, there's nice ways to reach us on there, uh, filing for the homestead or seeing us in person at one of our addresses. There is, these are all hyperlinks, directions to the property, uh, appraisers offices, uh, ways to reach us by email is at the bottom, as well as I have business cards here to give out. Uh, phone numbers and fax. So you can contact us anytime with any scenario that you want to run past us. We'll be happy to help you. Next, I've included these <clears throat> from the Department of Revenue because these lay out in such a way that you can pull these down with the hyperlinks on the PDF right here. And you can click on that link and get some informational guides to give to your taxpayers. You can give them to your buyers, your sellers. If these informational guides, especially the first time home buyers, I can't tell you how many times we've seen someone buy a property that had a huge cap that was reset to market. They come in and homestead and then they get their tax bill the next year. What happened? What happened? I thought my realtor applied for my homestead. Where is it? I don't have it. These are all real things that we've heard. I thought my lawyer applied for it. The closing agent did it for me. I know they did it for me, the title company. Well, that may be true in other states. It's not true here in Florida. Absent an application constitutes a waiver. And I cringe every time I have someone in front of me and Bill can attest to this. Whenever it is after the tax roll closes, and they get their tax bill. And now they're wondering what happened. I've got my escrow letter from the bank. The bank wants this much. I only paid this much. I'm short. You're short on your current taxes because the bank put out for you. And then they wanna catch up for future increases, 12 months worth. So for two years, for that whole year, you're gonna be paying double to catch up. So if you don't want your buyers in those predicaments, then please tell them to homestead, pull down this first time home buyers. It explains that process as to what happens because it's not the same as other states. I'm from New England. We've had no assessments and no increases for 30 years. And there was no budget to do so. So they just kept changing the millage rate. My assessment never moved. I was there. I could sell my house for 400,000. My assessed value was 300 or 30,000, sorry. Never moved. But here in Florida, it's every single year. And when a property transfers and people are coming in from out of state, I read Florida Bar dubbed this the welcome stranger effect. And I've seen it happen even to me when I first got to Florida. I didn't know. I didn't work for the property appraiser's office. I had no idea. Our realtor never said a word about it. So if you want your buyers to be those repeat kind of buyers, then you'll want to share this information, get this knowledge out there. It's super important. And it will save us from those conversations where, but wait, I didn't know, I didn't know. And we can't do anything. Once the tax bills are issued, 
we're done. We're done once trim is done, which is that mid-September date that we keep speaking of. That's what I was going to say. So when the, when the truth and millage notice or the trim notice gets mailed out, it's usually mailed out the third week of August. We, our window closes 25 days after we mail that. There's nothing we can do to help you as much as we might want to. So that's sort of fair warning at that point. Take that notice seriously and make sure your clients, you know, you can look at it for them and uh, call us. And we get a lot of calls. We'll help anybody. We don't want people to be in this predicament. We've got people who come to us who've lived in houses for years and said, well, oh, I didn't know about this. You know, and that's a shame because, you know, we want to give everyone every exemption they qualify for. You know, we're not in charge of revenue. We're not looking to raise revenue. If you qualify, you get it. But please, by all means, if there's any confusion or any doubt, give us a call. Can you speak to the appeal process? Why would anyone argue with that? Uh, <laughs> so yes, the way that the question was uh, speak to the appeal process. So included with the trim notice is a supplement that spells out what if I disagree? But the first thing you should do is contact us. It's the fastest, the easiest, and the cheapest to try to resolve your issue, whether your issue is an exemption or you disagree with the value. Uh, your, your next step, if you contact us, and we, we just disagree, you know, the appraiser, if it's a value question, who actually valued the property, will discuss it with you and try to reach a meeting of the minds. There very well could be something that we did not know when we appraised the property and our value is wrong and we will change it. I have to sign every one of those changes and there's a lot of them. The IT department helped me out with electronic signature which I'm very appreciative <laughs> for. So uh, by all means, contact us. Same with exemptions. So you got 25 days. If you don't hear from us or you don't even want to call us, you're so mad you don't want to call, you have 25 days from the mailing of the trim notice to file a petition with the value adjustment board. They're a impartial third party, not part of us. They're an independent body. You pay them $15 and they will schedule you a hearing in front of a special magistrate who doesn't work for the property appraiser, doesn't work for the county. Uh, most of them don't even live in Sarasota County and they will listen to both sides arguments and issue a ruling. And if you're successful, you'll get a refund of any taxes you paid in excess or any exemptions you did not have. You'll, you'll, get, you'll be made whole once that process ends. So it starts with the mailing of the trim but the value adjustment board, or if you've heard VAB, that process won't end until May, April or May of the following year. So a lot of time is going to pass before you find out. But once, you know, once it's done, you will be made whole or your client will be made whole. And the next step after that, if you still disagree, would be circuit court. And nobody wants to go there. All right. Have you guys ever seen a market the way it is now with the 10% market value increase from year to year? I know that was an estimate for 2022, but I didn't live here in the mid 2000s. So I was just curious to see where you think this is going to go. So the question is, have we ever seen a market going up this high? Um, this quick. This quick, right. You know, like in one year, <laughs> pretty much. I. It's funny. All anyone cares about with the tax roll is taxable value, taxable value, taxable value. But what you're asking me about is market value. So all the increases we publish and everything, it's always taxable value. But for market value, I, I rarely run that uh, calculation. But this is an interesting thing that you might address with your um, uh, out-of-state people who have a rental property here or you know, I'll sit there and it was funny when Darwin and I moved into uh, Esplanade, most of the people had out of state place. And you know, the first thing they did was, hi, my name is, and we're here six months in a day. I go, I don't care. Um, you know, <laughs> if you're ever in the house, just don't run it. Um, but um, those people, you know, I have a conversation with, and I say, you know, you really, what are your benefits in another state? And you ought to look at your benefits in Florida because if a house goes up, and I've, I've heard numbers of 25 to 40% in the last 12 months. Um, so if they're, 
is, you know, Lynn uses her hands, but you know, if the fair market value is up here and the taxable value is down here, and there's a 40, 50, 60% difference, they can know that their taxable value is gonna go up 10% every year until it catches up, until they, they even out. So, you know, they ought to look at where's the benefit. And, you know, for us that live in it as a primary resident, we go up by the CPI every year. And this year, the CPI was three. Well, the CPI was oh, right. seven. seven. Yeah. Yeah, seven. Yeah. So it's 3%. Um, so your taxable value will go up 3% this year if you've got a, um, a difference in there. And the difference, um, the largest difference that we have that I know of is like over a million. Well, David Vandals, three and a half. Oh. And I use the name because it's public record, but right. yeah, yeah so it was like uh, three and a half million dollars difference in taxable value and fair market value. And it's probably way over that uh, at this time. Right. And the, you know, the cap for the homestead cannot exceed 3%. So 3% is as high as it's ever going to get. It hasn't been 3% in 10 years. 2012 was the last time. It's been in the ones, 1 1.4, 2.9, 1.7. So it's a, it's a substantial savings for bona fide Florida residents. But you'll see people like in the paired uh, villa that she was talking about, where you know in times like this, if one side's homesteaded and one side didn't, the side that is homesteaded, their taxes could be 25% of what the other person's taxes are. And then every year, this year, they'll go up 3% and the other person goes up 10%. Julia. So I thought that I had heard somewhere in the last few years that, and this goes to renting your primary residence. Let's say you've got um, a house and then you know, an auxiliary dwelling and you decide you wanna rent that out on a fairly regular basis. Is there not something where you take that square footage away from your homestead and pay full taxes on that and still maintain your homestead on the other structure? There was one that we fought with the people and um, I think it all started because they put an article in the paper. Somebody was had written a story about how much money they were making for the little house in the backyard. And so we looked at it and said, well, they've got homestead on the big house and the little house. So yes, we took homestead off the little house. And that brings up, remember the same, all the things that this affects. So the big house will go up 3% this year. The little house can go up 10% in taxable value. Um, but yes, we can allocate that. And to further complicate things, the city of Sarasota has that uh, affordable housing accessory dwelling, accessory dwelling unit. unit, which has to be separate and has to have a homestead on it to even do it, I believe. so. There'll probably be a lot more of those uh, in the coming years. Yes, if you get into that uh, accessory dwelling unit conversation with somebody, um, it's they can only have an accessory dwelling unit, which means you're putting a single family's own property, you're putting two different families on. Um, but it can only happen if one of the properties is occupied by as a permanent resident. So they have their driver's license there, their voter's ID. There. County has that as well as the city. Yes, I believe they were passing it. And you know, for the brokers that are listening or the brokers that are in the room, if, if you want, you know, Lynn to come do this at an office meeting, uh, and you can tell her how much time she has, and she can do a short version or long version. Um, we also have uh, some people that uh, will come out and tell you how to uh, operate on our uh, website uh, to the maximum, and they do a real good job of navigating people. So. You know, if, if a broker wants us to come into an office meeting, uh, or I'll come in and just field questions. Uh, we love to get out and meet people and want to make sure that, you know, you're getting the exemptions you deserve. Cassidy, did you have some comments? Definitely have some questions. We may not be able to get to all of them, and they, they can do email. But. Okay. So just a few that are here. Is the Florida Homestead for a surviving spouse of a military veteran portable? Yes. Okay. Yes, it is portable. It's portable to the amount of the assessed limitation. The assessed value when they leave that property or abandon the previous property, it can be moved to a new homestead. 
Okay, and is the homeowner responsible for the portability or does your office catch this and adjust for people? <laughs> <laughs> so what we do when we take an application, we ask those questions. So the customer service counter or online, tell us your previous homestead residence information. We capture that and in our system based upon the abandoned date, it will generate the portability. Now, if you don't tell us and you tell us all about the rental that you've had in the last two years, but you had a homestead on the third year and we don't know about it, we're not going to process that. We're not going to be able to print that out for you. So that's why we asked those important questions. We treated like an interview to gather the information to try to best give you the exemptions you qualify for. Okay. What time frame constitute giving timely notice of qualification change, et cetera? So those cards go out in February. We expect a return by March 1. March 1 is considered timely, but any of those cards that come dribbling in after March 1st, all the way up to the end of trim is something that we can take care of for that tax year. Also, if a home is owned by three people, but only two of them live in the house, how does that affect their homestead? Depends. <laughs> it depends on how it's owned. So the ownership and entitlement that we spoke about in the slide. So if it's joint tenants with rights of survivorship, the homestead would be blanketed at 100% for those two owners that occupy the home. If the home is owned as tenants in common, two thirds of the property will get, get subject to the exemption and the assessment limitations. Okay. Would someone lose their homestead if they rent part of their home for more than 30 days for two consecutive years? Oh, well, that's in Supreme Court. Percentage, right, right. As of right now, percentage would be applied. So if you rent a quarter of the house, it would be 20, a quarter of it would not be homesteaded. Right, so the rule that we go by in Sarasota County is bedroom count. So if there's three bedrooms and you're renting out two, two thirds would be non-homesteaded, one third would be subject to the homestead because it's based on ownership and use and the definitions in the statute and the definition of assessed and used and classified as your homestead. Okay, what does it mean when the NLS listing says no homestead and it is not an empty lot? Um, well, no. it just means that the <laughs> property didn't they, homestead. They just didn't apply for the homestead. I, I think it's that, right, right. that clear. I believe, I believe the indicator is, does the property appraiser show homestead on that parcel? And the answer is no, for whatever reason, whether they don't qualify, they don't want it. Uh, I actually did speak to someone who qualified and said, no, I don't want to break. I want to pay my taxes. And no. that is a true story. <laughs> it's been one guy, keep, keep in mind, in 14 years. But, Still, what happened? As a manager, I think the heads up really the, what I used to hear more complaints from our customer base was is that if you give a potential buyer the NLS printout and it is homesteaded and their taxes reflect X, and you don't explain to them that they're coming in buying that and they're going to not live there, double whammy, and you're not going over that with them, they're going to be upset with you. Even though they didn't ask you about it, I think it's your inherited responsibility to let them know about that. All right, somebody brought up the tent example from earlier and asked the structural requirements for homestead property. So there must be, according to that Enrique, uh, Baldwin v. Enriquez uh, the, out of the DCA, there must be a dwelling to reside upon. So the tent is not considered a dwelling. Okay, can you homestead a home owned by an LLC? Depends. <laughs> it depends on if there is a 99 year lease for the occupant of the property. And if that 99 year lease is recorded in the public record indicating who the uh, lessee is, then that person would be entitled to homestead. Okay, 
when a full-time owner moves homes of exemption for running out of accessory dwelling located on his homestead property. I think the same question yeah. as before. Yeah, it would just be apportioned. Someone asked about a mobile home. Ah, so a mobile home that is permanently affixed to real property, they can acquire a RP sticker with the tax collector, and we would assess it as a building on the land, and then we would tax it. Now, there are several mobile home communities in our county some that have the 99 year lease assignment those are entitled to homestead under that provision but if you own the land and own the mobile home and acquire the rp or real property sticker with a dr402 form then you are not tax text or, or the annual license fee the registration fee goes away and the rp sticker takes its place it has to be real property a lot of mobile homes that they don't own the land and it is considered a vehicle. They pay a, a fee like a license plate to the tax collector. What if two single people each having a homestead property get married? Can both homesteaded properties benefit from the exemptions? No, no. That was the slide where newlyweds take note. So if two single people get married, they need to figure out which home is going to still claim the homestead. We leave that up to the taxpayer, absent and uh, notification from the taxpayer. If they are both within the county, we send them a letter. If we get no reply to that letter, when we see a marriage happen within the county, then we would remove both homesteads. It's up to them to then come in to prove entitlement in which home they want a homestead. And continuing on that is if they were to decide to live in house A, husband's house or wife's house, whichever, uh, then they can file and port back and take the higher of the two if the property is then retitled in both their names. The Airbnb rentals have the same effect as a normal rental period other than 30 days per year. Absolutely. Okay, well, husband is a veteran, husband has deed in his name only. The husband and wife divorce, husband leaves the home and wife stays in the home. Husband and wife decide to sell a home in two years. Husband purchases another home within a three year time frame. Is he allowed a portable tax benefit on his new home? If the husband is the, uh, did you say they divorced? <laughs> Back that up a little. I would say see an attorney. <laughs> <laughs> she said they divorced they divorced if, if they divorce that veterans benefits goes with that veteran whether they had that hundred percent total and permanent status they own that home they moved from that home established a homestead elsewhere they get that entitlement it stays with the veteran as long as they're living someone asked if you know the email for application of a Bradenton homestead they know they can google manatee property appraiser and that'll be on their site so just a reminder that um she gave you lynn thank you so much great great information brian as well uh, but you got that last couple of sheets that had all of their email addresses and contact information and as bill said he and this crew are most delighted to come out into your offices so take advantage of that along with the they have a gal that does the website navigation and it's really really good so on behalf of the attorney realtor attorney joint committee i want to thank you all and and those of you who attended here today and those of you who are on zoom have a great rest of the day thank you so much thank you, thank you. Thank you.